My name's Tracy Bartram and I'm a comedian and I didn't start doing that until 21 years ago. In fact, I've been doing it 21 years in December this year. I was in sales. Um, on my first job, I was a typist and I was terrible. I couldn't type and I was working for the mother of someone at school. I just answered this random ad and lied and got the job and I was really bad at everything <laughs> everything I did, but I was good at talking and, um, you know, I was a bit of a control freak, so whatever I did, I did really well. But, you know, I just was just, I don't know, stumbling along from one administrative job to the next and I got into sales and, and then I got the sack from one of my sales jobs and I couldn't get another job. And um, so I did a personal development course. It was a metaphysical thing for about 12 weeks and halfway through that course I thought, hmm, I think I might do stand-up comedy and everybody went, oh, thank God, you know, because I was just all over the shop. You know, I was just one of those people that was on all the time. Oh, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I, um, I was so, I was one of these people that, you know, when I do this, then I'll be ready to do it. You know, when I've found someone who can help me to write, then I'll go and do a triad thing. I couldn't just get up and do it. I had to go through all the steps and I suppose convince myself that I had done everything I could to prepare myself for, you know, the great unknown. I mean, it's an enormous leap. Um, and I did a, a tryout night at the Melbourne Hilton. There used to be a comedy club downstairs and that was where I did my first gig. I suppose it was that, um, that moment of knowing that making people laugh was a really valid thing to do. That um, energetically, I was giving them something which was a laugh and them, give, them, them giving me that laugh back was like a tsunami. It was like, oh wow, it just feels so great. The more I made them laugh, the more they laughed and the more they laughed, the more confidence it gave me. There's that whole idea of all comedians are crying clowns and we weren't loved enough as children and all those cliches. And, but I do actually believe that for a lot of us that's true. Um, so it's a way of connecting with people and getting that love that we maybe didn't get as children. But I think the secret is doing that personal development work as well so that you're not going out on stage needy. You're going out on stage transparent. So the more transparent I am, the better my performance is. I didn't know the first thing about radio. And I just remember in the interview, they said, you know, what, are you, would you call yourself a morning person? I went, no, you know, I go to bed at two in the morning. And, um, you know, I still do, even if I'm doing breakfast radio, sometimes I'll have two or three hours sleep because I just hate going to bed so early, missing out on something. So, um, but radio's fabulous. I really love it. And I think too, it's that path of least resistance. I never set a goal to do radio. It just happened and I found that I was really good at it, but I wasn't trying to be good at it. I just did it. I just got the gift of the gab. Oh, I'd been drinking from the age of 11. My father was an alcoholic, so, you know, that's the culture that I grew up in. And I, I kept drinking until you know, eight years ago. So, and it was a problem, but no one was ever brave enough to say, I think you've got a problem. Whereas, oh yeah, they must have, yeah. I mean, I think one of the worst things was after I'd left Fox FM, um, I was having coffee in the Dandenong Rangers and the girl behind the counter said, um, oh, hi, I'm a big fan and I met you at a Fox FM function at the Metro and I was behind the bar and you were so smashed. It was just hilarious. And, um, you know, we were just told, give her whatever she wants. And I listened to her and I said, look, I, I, um, I'm just filled with shame at the moment and I'm trying to let that go, but the, the primary emotion for alcoholics is shame, that we wake up feeling horrified that we did it again, that we got smashed again. And um, I said to her, look, you know, I'm sure you've been dining out on that Tracy Bartram story, but I'd be really grateful if you don't tell it anymore. And, you know, but what I got from that was how irresponsible that network was, knowing that clearly I had a problem, but no one was actually brave enough to sit me down and say, can we help you? What can we do to support you? Um, but I must have been so terrifying that they didn't. And alcoholics who are not in recovery are terrifying because we have to be right and we will make everybody else wrong and we'll justify anything. So giving that up was a pivotal turning point 
in my life. And then, of course, it uncovered all my other addictions. I went into an eating disorder. I started smoking again. I've been off them now for six weeks, and it's forever now because they're, they're worse for me than alcohol. So most of us addicts have layers of addiction. So, you know, I know that part of my life's work is helping people through that. And that was just another thing that happened. It was just I kept getting asked to talk about that. But I do it within the framework of giving them a laugh at the same time. I wanted to find my creative self. I needed to do the other things that I knew I was put on this planet to do. So I went from being the highest paid broadcaster in, in Victoria to pretty much unemployed overnight. This massive income to nothing overnight and jumping into that abyss. And there, you know, I mean, I had bookings, you know, I had stuff lined up, but certainly nothing that was anywhere near the money I'd been earning. But I knew that I had to I had to um, do what was right for me. I just couldn't keep doing what was right for everybody else. I work at the ABC as a fill-in now and I do all this other stuff because I remember thinking, well, you know, what do I want to create? What do I want to make in my life? So I you know, put a jazz band together, which is great fun, and we're recording our first album. And um, I started doing personal development seminars and, and just doing more MC work. You know, I get to travel overseas and host events, and that's great fun. And, you know, I really love what I do, but I haven't even scratched the surface of what I want to do creatively. We get caught up in material stuff. We get attached, you know. The Buddhists say the more you can let go of attachment, the more you're, the easier your path to enlighten, enlightenment will be. I'm paraphrasing because I know that's not right. But, you know, we do get attached to things. I mean, I'm hanging out for an iPad, but do I need one? No. I've got a MacBook and it's perfectly serviceable. I've got an iPhone. That Both of those are tools that I use. But I don't need to rush out and buy the latest thing. And I think that's what keeps us in the daily grind of jobs that we don't really like because we've overcommitted or we're frightened. We're just frightened to have a go. And I always say to people, you know, it's like that guy that, on your pilot on creative beers, it's, you know, the guy who wants to do windsurfing, oh, I couldn't do that, you know. I mean, I remember when I was living in Perth and um, the guy came around to paint our house and I asked him what he, you know, because he hated it, he said he hated painting. I said, well, what would you do? You know, he said, I'd love to do massage. His whole face shifted. And I said, well, why don't you do a part-time course and see if you like it? I said, because you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. He said, you know, I might do that. Anyway, he was going on holidays with his girlfriend and he came to see my show. I was doing a, a run at one of the theatres in Perth. And um, he came and said, you know, I've never been to a comedy show. I've never laughed so much. It was just fantastic. And he went on holiday and I went on holiday. And when we were coming back from Bali, I picked up the newspaper and there he was on the front page. He got killed by a bus. The driver of the bus had fallen asleep and he and his girlfriend had gone over to elope. He was 32 and he didn't live the life he wanted to live because he was painting because his dad wanted that. People are creative, but they generally they think they're not because they've been told they're not. You know, I can't do anything with my hands apart from cook and gesticulate. You know, I, I went to a jewellery making workshop once and got smacked on the back of the hand by the woman taking the class because I was doing it all wrong. It's not my skill set. I can't do macrame either, but you know, I'd rather stab, stab myself in the eye with a fork. You know, there are some things that we we try and we fail and we think, oh well, I'm I'm not creative. But we are, we've just got to find the right creative outlet. So, you know, some people are great gardeners and it gives them enormous joy. I can't grow anything, you know. I, I can tell people where I want thing pla things planted and, you know, with my last marriage, we had a great veggie patch that I thought about and said, that's what I want. And my then husband built it for me, but I didn't know how to do it. You know, sometimes it's about asking people to help you create what you want. But as far as, you know, doing the things that we're good at. I always think it's the things that we're the best at that we negate. We think, oh, well, that's just no big deal. I don't have to work for it. We, we have this idea that it's got to be hard to make it valuable, but we, we're all born with talents. So in the words of Marianne Williamson, who wrote Mel Nelson Mandela's maiden speech, who are you not to let your own light shine? You know, I really had to heal. I mean, I, I left this enormous celebrity umbrella um, into, you know, 
finding out who I was, which sounds really cliche, but I had to go and heal. That's why I went to live in the country. I just wanted to get away from all the distractions and meditate and sleep and heal and be kind to myself. So I now teach workshops on self-care, self-love, because we most of us have this inherent self-loathing because that's what we were told when we were kids. So we can undo all of that. We're all trying to fill that emptiness, that void within us. We're all trying to do that, which is why we smoke and we overeat and why we overshop and why we get sex addictions. And we're just trying to, you know, find the rest of ourselves. But the point is, it's, it's all in here. You know, we are our own God. Well, you know, it's not up there. But as far as, you know, why we're addicts, I don't know, I think it makes us interesting. It gives us our history, I think. The challenge is to work through the addiction and come out the other side and still still feel that we can do what we do. I mean, I was terrified that if I, if I got sober, I just wouldn't be funny anymore. Um, admittedly, um, I don't like going to pubs and I find parties mind-numbingly dull, so I don't do it anymore because I, I could only do it if I was pissed. Because let's face it, who likes standing around making small talk with strangers unless you're looking for a shag? You know, that's what people do. It's like, great, who else is here? But seriously, we all want this stuff. We all want to connect. People don't tend to value art. The world would be a miserable place without us, without artists, but it's about us valuing ourselves. And I think it's our lack of self-esteem that allows us to go, well, all right, I'll, I'll do it for nothing. Where we need to actually say, mm, I'll meet you halfway, let's find out a reasonable fee, let's work out what you want, but if you're paying everybody else, why are you asking me to not charge you? It's an interesting thing, you know, you wouldn't get your house built for nothing, everybody gets paid, but for some reason, you know, the artistic people are expected to do it for free because, oh, that's nothing, you know, it's just your thoughts. It's all about profile, and um, but it's connecting. So, you know, I mean, I found a picture in a cake shop of a flowerless orange cake, but it was spelt F-L-O-W-E-R-L-E-S-S, -S -S, and I thought that was hilarious. So I posted it on Facebook, and it got like 97 comments, and, and then I got an email from the person in the shop who said, oh, that's my shop, and I can't believe it. I'm so embarrassed, and, but it was funny because people want to connect, and I, I love Facebook for that reason. I mean, I know you're a Twitter boy. I still haven't really got it. I think it's because I like the pictures. Um, but I just find it easy to use. I find Twitter a little bit confusing, but I know it's important, you know, and then there's LinkedIn, there's all that viral stuff. I think it's just the way of the world now. You have to pay attention to that or you will get left behind. And, you know, I get bookings through Facebook. I do. It's, um, it's the way it goes. I get more hits on Facebook than I do on my own website. But that's the magic of it all putting people together, yeah, yeah. networking, but being selfless around it rather than what's in it for me. It's like, how can I be of service? When we come from service, everything rearranges itself. You know, you've got to look after yourself first, but if you can really be coming from a higher place and thinking, how can I help people um, without compromising my own stuff. You know, can I help people, you know, there would be years ago when I would have, wouldn't even been involved in this project because there was no money in it. We talked about that before we started filming. You know, what, you've got no money? Sorry. Whereas now it's like, yeah, of course I'll be involved in this project. It sounds fun. Yeah, it's the sort of thing that I like to do. You've just got to connect with the fun part of your life. You know, you, you really, are. nobody on their deathbed ever said, gee, I wish I'd spent more time at work. They just don't. Most people have enormous regrets about what they didn't do, you know. You just got to do it. You just got to jump in. Sell the house. Live in a caravan. <laughs> do what you want to do. Seriously. It's just, life's just so short.